but generally speaking, I think it obviously uh, should have the biggest budget in the world, is what I always think, because it's the most demanding show to make. You've got one set that you use every week, the inside, inside the TARDIS, and two main characters, sometimes three, mm. they run out the doors of that set in the first minute, and everything else you're buying, everything else costs you. So I, it should have the biggest budget in the whole world. Stephen Moffat is the writer behind many things that you might have watched, several series of Doctor Who, Sherlock, Dracula, before that coupling, joking apart, and our all-time favourite, Press Gang. His latest venture, though, is into the world of theatre with a new play called The Unfriend, now on in London after an initial run in Chichester. And Stephen is with us now. Very good afternoon. Good afternoon. So this tells the story of Peter and Debbie and their two teenage children. Tell us more about them and who moves into their world. Well, Peter and Debbie are two people I actually know in real life and the first 20 minutes of this play actually happened. They were on a cruise and they met a flamboyant American lady whom they sort of liked but found a bit much and she seemed to know everyone on the ball. But they did that thing, uh, that way of getting rid of somebody which is we must keep in touch and exchange emails. And when this woman announced that she was uh, coming to stay, to their great horror, they thought it was maybe worth Googling her. Um, because she had rather an unusual name, I won't give the real name, I'll give the name she has in the play which is Elsa Jean Krakowski, they discovered she was a killer. I mean, an actual multiple killer, a serial killer. Someone who was on the loose only because of a, a, on a, on a legal technicality. Someone who committed really, really horrible, awful murders. Not nice murders, like killing an abusive husband or something. Really horrid ones. And she was coming to stay. And they had to spend a, an agonising night trying to compose an email that wasn't too offensive. <laughs> You know, to say, you know, basically, I mean, we are making no judgments, but honestly, our kids are against murdering. Something like that. They eventually managed to, uh, to, to send that email and forestall her, but in the play version, Elsa turns up and they spend their time in an agony of embarrassment wondering how to raise the issue of the fact that she's a multiple killer. So when your friends first told you that story, mm. how long did it then take for you to think that is winning and I can do something with oh, it. Oh, instantly. Okay. Uh, I was, uh, we were away in France uh, with uh, Peter, whose real name is Peter, uh, <laughs> and uh, we're sitting on a patio with my brother-in-law and Peter, and uh, we, uh, we were just exchanging stories, and he started telling me this one. And I had this terrible, cold idea that maybe there was another writer in earshot, and I'd have to kill them, because I thought, no, that's perfect. And I said to him, can I have that? And he said, what do you mean? I said, can I have it? Can I write a play based on that? and just change it so that she turns up. And he laughed and said, yes, so long as I didn't change his name. I didn't. Sorry, Peter. And uh, uh, so he could come to the first night. He never thought it was going to happen, but uh, a year and a half later, I told him I'd written it. It absolutely has. So when he was telling you that story, was that little nugget about manners the, the thing also that attracted you? Because this is a comedy of manners, isn't it? It's about the difficulty that people have being honest when they're kind of, they've got this terrible... Th portcullis of manners in front of them. Yes. I mean, it's absolutely about that. It's about, I find it very, very difficult ever to be offensive uh, to someone if they're actually in the room. I'm brilliant if they're not there and no one can hear me. I'm amazingly incisive and interrogative. But the moment I'm actually face to face with a human being, I can't say anything. I just couldn't imagine how I would explain to someone that they couldn't cook for my children because they might poison them. I'd probably just take the poisoning risk, you know? Yeah, I that mean... is weird, though, isn't it? Because you, I think of, of all of the cases I've heard of people who shouldn't come to stay with you, that mm. is by far the worst. It, and you'd be entitled to say, mm. uh, you're absolutely terrifying and please mm. never darken our yeah. door again. Yes, you would. I yeah. would. Uh, but, you know, uh, worse yet is if... Because uh, what I kept saying to Peter is... What if you'd Googled her later? She'd been in your house. Ooh. And I was just trying to imagine that. What do you say? Um, do you like the spare room? What do you want for breakfast? Please leave. You're a killer. OK. Yeah. Uh, so your friends know that this is based on a true story, their yeah. truth. Does the does the nasty piece of work know that the play's on? I'm praying not, because she has a pastime that I find quite alarming. Um, and she's a real person and... Uh, Obviously, I haven't used her real name, and I'm I'm hoping not to see her on any night in so the just criteria. Just to be clear, she's not in prison. She's not in prison. No, there was. Uh, she spent, I think, six months something like that. Okay. Uh, and because there was some uh, sort of legal technicality that it got wrong, and she was released, and uh, she's out there.
Do you know, I've Still. always been a little bit worried about cruises, and now I'm really well, no. going on. I don't think it's typical of cruises. I have to say that. <laughs> I think you know there are many people you can meet on a cruise who are not murderers. Okay. Why write it for the stage and not for the place where you've made such a name for yourself on TV? It just felt like a play is one reason. It felt like that. And I think it is that. Because the nice thing about a play is you sort of confine it to one place quite easily without having to explain. You, I mean, if you can maybe do the television version, you have, to, you have to go and see her, or what she does, what she does when she's not in the house. Somehow just that contained feeling felt right. Also, I'd been sort of desperate to, to do a play because I had spent 33 years or something doing exactly the same thing all the time. So mm. was... And can you sneak into the theatre and watch performances and, you know, feel confident about it? Do you get affected by maybe you're sitting, you know, next to the one person who doesn't laugh oh, in the place I've, that I've you Oh, I've been wanted. in it quite a lot. Yeah. I've been... Uh, and, yeah, that is that is a hazard. I sat next to someone the other day who uh, who simply and continuously cleared his throat. That's all he did. He went, <coughs> every 20 seconds. And I thought, he just sounded like he was cross or that he was going to interrupt. He probably had a cold, let's yeah, be honest. Yeah, I mean, that's possible. I still yeah. punched him. But, uh, you know, it was fine. Can we just... Um, let's go into the conversation. So, man with stellar TV career approaches the world of theatre and says, I've written a play. What, mm. What's the reaction? Uh, dare they be snooty to you? Well, let me tell you what the reaction was, because this isn't the first play. Uh, when I left Doctor Who and Sherlock, uh, and I thought, well, I really fancy writing a play, I wrote a play, which was not this one. And I thought, being as, you know, I'm me, surely the whole world will flock to my door and weep with gratitude when I hand open... No, they didn't. I, I sent it off and most of them didn't reply. <laughs> so, did they not know the name? Yeah, I'm sure they did, but, well, well, you know, once, once you take the TARDIS away, who cares? Uh, it was... Uh, so, Gosh, no... It's, it's brutal. I mean, so, are they that snooty? It's not snooty. I think they just didn't like the play. And that's I fair enough. That. Yeah, no, I suppose... Yeah. Is, well, is it, though? I mean, because TV is... I'm just amazed that there's the possibility, even, that people in theatre might look down on wild. I don't think they looked down TV. on me. I think they didn't want to put that play on. I mean, that's. Uh, I think there's a sort of uh, illusion that you get to a sort of level in the industry where people just say, well, he's famous, so we better spend millions on him. That doesn't happen. That never happens. I've got loads of stuff that's been turned down. Mm, OK. Like I'm to quite see. right, too, by the way. Quite right, right okay. too. Yeah. You've got two teens in the story. Yeah. Are they harder to write than ever before because teens are in a very knowing world these days? Um, well, I've got, you know, I recently had two teenagers. <laughs> they're, they're, they've grown a little. Now they're in their early 20s. But no, I don't think so. I think teenagers are very much the same as... I, I mean, I, obviously, I remember teenagers differently when I was a teenager because I was right about everything. But surprisingly enough, modern teenagers are wrong about everything and I'm still the one who's right. So it's changed. It's changed over the years. And do you think a modern teen would be able to sit down and watch Press Gang and enjoy it? Because it was set in a time when they were creating a paper, like a proper mm, newspaper, yeah. every day. They didn't have the social media, they didn't have the phones, they mm. didn't have all of that... Do you think it would still... I have no idea is, it, is the re, uh, real answer to that because I, I, every time I've suggested to my sons that they might want to watch my old television show, they said, no. Uh, so I don't know how it would play with modern teens, but uh, I, think, I think it's quite good, so I think it might be all right. They're perfectly capable of watching things set in the past. And curiously, all the things you talk about there don't impact tremendously on television. I was thinking about that. You know when on TV shows, uh, quite regular when you watch them, even really modern, really, really good ones, people turn up at the door, ring the doorbell and come in for a coffee. Mm. Do you, I don't even... I, I would be astonished if any of my friends turned up at my door what, without what, warning without, me four yeah. times in advance, mm. emailing me, shed. I, I get surprised if someone phones me without texting first. But, but say, we don't do it on television. In television, people still do yeah. the old-fashioned way. But yeah. there is, I've never seen a home that looks genuine, a home that looks genuine on television. Mm. We still have these curious, clutter-free environments and these Well, you know, there's one of the kitchens. reasons for that, one of the reasons for that is you, to make a show, a, a, a room look cluttered on television, you have to make it insanely cluttered. The camera clean, oh, is that right? okay. cleans up everything. So what you go you on, on the camera? set and you think it looks really cluttered and normal and real and then you put it on telly and it's suddenly it's sparkling and lovely and you could sell bread from it. I mean, it's... Uh... 
Though Different I'm not thing. sure you're right on that, Garth. I don't want to start I a fight here. I write about <laughs> television for the Radio Times. So I'm thinking Can't of the be. house Sorry in, about that, in Outnumbered. It was one of the reasons why I well, loved maybe... that series, because think, it was yeah. it was so messy, and, and maybe they I'm had exactly of, the same. And maybe I'm thinking of Channel 5 dramas at 9 o'clock. Oh, really? OK. Uh, and possibly someone at the ITV. Okay. <laughs> uh, can, can you watch something like Happy Valley without, uh, you know, seeing the kind of furniture of your trade in it? I've, not, I've got no problem with forgetting that I work in television. None at all. None. None whatsoever. Are we going to struggle during this interview to make you pin down your talent, Stephen? I feel oh, that well, we are. But pin down my talent? Yes. I think people have struggled with that for 30 years. Do you years, struggle with Frank. it? Right. With, with pinning down my talent? Well, no, with celebrating your talent. Celebrating? Yeah. Oh, that would be a very strange thing to do. <laughs> What we've no. got here, Fee, is a taciturn Scott. A taciturn? <laughs> I thought I was talking quite a lot. <laughs> I'm being argumentative. Okay. Uh, did you watch the recent Happy Valley series? Oh, and see, I knew you were going to ask that. Um, I'm, I'm just up to date with the second season. That's okay. how late I am. So I'm doing this thing, which I had to do a few years ago with Broadchurch, of walking into a room saying, I don't know, so don't tell me. And uh, Chris Chibnall was a good friend of mine, so uh, it was really embarrassing that I hadn't seen Broadchurch until later. So I'm I'm just out of step. Sorry. Well, don't worry, I'll scrap the next ten questions. And okay, we'll just please move do that. On to something please else. do that. Well, we did want to ask you actually about that uh, kind of balance between box sets and the way that we used to watch television. And mm. Happy Valley seems to have proved something mm. uh, that actually we are still interested in series that we can't consume all at once, you know, had very good... Well, surely because... that's partly a function of how it's provided for you. Yes, I we mean, didn't have a choice. You didn't have a choice, true. so, I mean, that's not us voting with our feet. It's but why just... Why do people get bothered about that at all? Should Does really anyone bothered? really get bothered? Is it well, just are, television are, people? Well, I think you'll find there are articles, articles in the newspapers about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, but I mean real people, not people who write articles in newspapers. But no, I, think, I think it is... I enjoyed this season of Happy Valley because I was made to wait for it and it became a part of my weekend. I think it's a perfectly valid way to do it and, I, and most of the shows I've ever done have been that way. Um, but at the same time, if uh, I, I can also see the logic in just saying... You know, your bookcase doesn't tell you when you can read the next chapter. Why should your television tell you when you watch the next episode? I've enjoyed yeah. both. Have I also, with the, with the recent show, which I very much enjoyed, The Traitors, mm -hmm. you know, you had to wait. And I, I, I like that, fine. But I think, there are, I, I imagine there will always be room for both. That, you know, the show that just suddenly is available through it and the other show that makes you wait. Mm. Sometimes in some shows, if you really want to... Uh, have people agonise about a cliffhanger, then it's good to, to make them. So you wouldn't, as a creator, you wouldn't insist on the way, the, the method by which your show is delivered? <laughs> I could try insisting. That would be interesting. Um, you get told how your show is delivered. Uh, I mean, recently we did a, a three-part Dracula, which went out in consecutive nights, and I was a bit uneasy about it. I didn't think that was right for it at all. I thought uh, I, I would have liked it to have been over three different weeks but you don't get a say in that and in total fairness what do i know about scheduling so so what's included in the term show runner which is mm. what you've been described as um well what the real job title is and kind of you know within the, you know contractually and in the credits you'll notice there is no role showrunner but what it generally speaking means uh is the uh the exec uh, is executive producer and lead writer or sometimes executive producer and solo writer of the show so the the one of the executive producers who also writes it it's it's probably sort of total editorial control it's control of the fiction of it right. if it didn't really happen i gave the order so it is king of the heap. Mm. King of the heap in a way. Oh, Tell that to my wife. Tell guess. that to my... Uh, all the people I work with would be astonished to know that I was king of the heap. He's still not going to take it, is he? We haven't got <laughs> on to Harry Seacombe yet. No, we, we'll get him on that. <laughs> Moffat is our guest this afternoon. We were talking about his new play, The Unfriend, which is on in London. It premiered down in Chichester. We will talk about lots of other things that you've done. We've got a lot to pack in, in that case, into the last seven minutes of the programme. Uh, Stephen, you've lent into your own life a lot for your work. Mm. So press gang... As a student, chalk your time as a teacher, joking apart about the breakup of your first marriage, mm. coupling about falling in love again. Yeah. What would the drama of a super successful man of your age now be about and look like? Or oh, just a man on a sofa eating, I think, wouldn't it? <laughs> I mean, it'd probably be something like that. I don't think I don't think there's been a show about a showrunner. Probably because It'd just be watch. boring. But a serious question. Okay. What would be the stories that you would want to tell about a man of your age? A man of my age? Um, I never... I don't know. I haven't a clue. I haven't a clue. Because I don't even know... 
uh, that I'm typical of men of my age. Uh, do you know, I'm not sure what I would say about that. Just probably being generally grumpy do and cross think, with everybody else. Can we take you to the world of Doctor Who? Because oh, I, I, I wondered when you would. Well, um, yes, I had a feeling mm. you might be wondering mm. about that. Um, if I'm honest, and hey, we may as well no, be honest. No, don't be honest. No, no, lie. No, lie, I, no, lie I, constructively. If I were to lie... Even, flatter, flatter. Even constructively, the only way. I, would, I would have to say that I was a massive fan of Doctor Who. But in truth, it was a world whilst I utterly get that to some people it mattered more than almost anything else. I never got it. Did you get Doctor Who? I, I mean, was... in any incarnation. I'm talking... I go back to John Pertwee, and I didn't get it then. Well, I think we probably share the same Doctor Who. It's a bit of a kind of... Uh, it's a dating mechanism. It is a dating <laughs> mechanism, yeah. uh, I liked it very much when I was younger, uh, but I did find it absolutely terrifying. And terrifying, too, yeah. But, yeah, I have terrifying. kids who absolutely lived by yeah. your Doctor Who's. Right. Sorry, I interrupted the flow of your question. No, there, it was really just about how you felt about entering what is a world that the fans, the aficionados, they hold it so dear, it's so significant to them. And you come in and you start doing things with it. What was that like? Enormously good fun. I mean, first of all, I, I always was a Doctor Who fan. I absolutely adore Doctor Who. Although I did find it terrifying as mm. well. I noticed you you explained how indifferent you were to Doctor Who for quite a long while before admitting you were terrified. Well, I was only not a the small, same thing. Small girl not the same even. thing. You were not indifferent. You were too frightened to watch well, it, not which of, is magical not and wonderful. Not of the Daleks, I wasn't. No. Well, you weren't, well, well done, because they're not very frightening. But the Cybermen are really yeah, awesome. Okay, and maybe, the Weeping Angels. Were. I mean, come on. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what, what was it like coming in? You are aware that when you're dealing, or how shall I put it, with the hyper-invested that nothing will ever be right and certainly nothing will ever be right for everyone. That's fair enough. That's absolutely fair enough. Mm. But as Russell once put it, uh, if a Doctor Who fan hates an episode, that means they watch it 30 times instead of 40. It's all right. You're not actually playing to that audience no. really at all. Um, and the first people to agree with that would be Doctor Who fans who would like the show to be a mainstream hit so they know that, that they're not always going to be catered for in the front line. So it's fine. It was just brilliant. It was just brilliant fun to do that show. I loved it. Absolutely loved it. Was it a big budget? No, it's not as big a budget at any point as it ever should have been. I think uh, I think Russell's got some more now, which is good. That's Russell uh, T Davis. Yeah, Russell T Davis is charge, back yeah. in charge of it again. Uh, but generally speaking, I think it obviously uh, should have the biggest budget in the world, is what I always think, because it's the most demanding show to make. You've got one set that you use every week, the inside inside the TARDIS and two main characters, sometimes three, mm. they run out the doors of that set in the first minute and everything else you're buying, everything else costs you. So I, it should have the biggest budget in the whole world. It but never so. quite, it's never quite big enough. But, right. you know, the modern show has been uh, a rather handsome show, I think. Yeah, oh, that's a nice way of putting it. Very handsome. handsome show. Mm. Mm. Can I ask you about diversity in your business? Uh, looking back over your career, how much do you think you benefited from simply being a clever white man? I have absolutely no idea because I've only ever been there. But do you recognise that you might have had a an easier path or would you see that as denigrating your success? I, I, I think if you're unaware of how lucky you've been throughout your life, then luck will show you what else it can do. So I'm always feeling fortunate about everything. And certainly uh, I imagine that it's better to be the white man than otherwise, but uh, uh, was I aware of it? Not of that, of other things. Other things you can be aware of. I was aware of uh, the fantastic advantage of coming from a loving home. <laughs> I mean, that's an amazing advantage uh, and having a decent education and all that. But uh, I wasn't uh, I wasn't aware of uh, of the, the diversity thing, no. Mm. Uh, do you but that feel... does, doesn't mean it's not there, obviously no, no, no. it is. I just mean if you're and asking... And do you feel, because obviously you know your industry much better than we do, do you think that people have woke, woken up to it enough now in the commissioning process, that enough arms are being extended? It feels as though every effort is being made. Yes, it. but, you know, I, that doesn't mean I'm right to say that. Um, you know, I've I've been around television for 30 odd years I've never met anyone and I've met people from a, you know contrary to what people say about television there's a fair width of political viewpoint in it from uh, left to right um, I've never met anyone who didn't think diversity was a good idea mm. yes. I've never met one single I mean not one single human being who didn't think the equal opportunity that diversity or all these things were good were, were something to work for I never met anyone who was against it 
Um, so if it's not happening or if it's not happening fast enough or it, if it doesn't work as well as you would wish it to, then maybe it's more complicated than we think it is. But I am no expert. We're all experts in our own little human way, and you're right to say all of that. Uh, just very briefly before you go, we've only got about ten seconds left. Uh, if you have an evening on the sofa tonight, what do you watch? The Unfriend. <laughs> uh, in, the, in the Criterion Theatre. <laughs> At 7.30. Please come along. I'll be there with my wife. It's our 25th wedding anniversary. Come and say hello. Beautifully done. Uh, Stephen, thank you very much indeed for your time today. It's been really lovely to meet you. Pleasure.